Hello and welcome to the latest edition of The Shindig. I'm your usual host, Dr. Tom Horn, and this is brought to you by the Red River Archaeology Group. We have another spectacular short episode for you today about Neolithic Cranogs, these artificial islets in the Western Isles of Scotland. And we're talking to Professor Duncan Garrow as part of our Dig It Scotland special series. The ones that we are focusing on are mainly built in stone, although as it turns out in timber underneath the stone in some cases. Everyone maybe has heard of Cranogs. They're widespread over Scotland and Ireland. But did you know we've now got evidence that they go back to the Neolithic? We previously thought that they were maybe late Bronze Age, Iron Age through to post-medieval. But these incredible islands, artificial islands made by humans, possibly for living and as well as ritual deposition, um, are now going back even further to some of the earliest farmers that settled in Scotland. Um, some fantastic... Um early Neolithic pots, which Mark, who I mentioned before, was able to, who was working at the museum, was able to identify. And if you listen to this podcast, you'll find out some of the amazing archaeological survivals, the incredible ceramics that they're finding, and also evidence for organics too. So if you really want to think in a completely new way about something you think you maybe know a bit about, listen to this podcast. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us here today, Duncan. Um, as you know, this is part of the the special um, to do with Dig It Scotland. We're really highlighting some of the most exciting archaeological excavations and projects that are going on over this summer. And you work on a project known as Islands of Stone, which is about Neolithic cranogs in the Outer Hebrides, also known as the, the Western Isles. And maybe you could begin by telling our listeners a little bit about this project, maybe how it started as well, um, your role in it. And I think a good place to, to begin really would be to explain to our listeners who will be from all around the world what uh, a Cranog is and where we are in, in the world. Sure. So um, the Outer Hebrides or Western Isles are... Off the northwest coast of mainland Scotland, which is the north of the UK. Um, and uh, so um, we, a, a, and you've also asked me about Cranogs, uh, which has been a matter of some debate over the years, but put simply, like many things in archaeology, but um, put simply, they are artificial islands in, in lakes or lochs, as you'd call them, um, in that part of the world that people have constructed. Uh, as you can guess from the title of our project, the ones that we are focusing on are mainly built in stone, although as it turns out in timber underneath the stone in some cases, um, but in some parts of Scotland and Ireland as well, where they're also found, they are built from just timber. Um, and it all kind of depends on what whether you've got handy stones available locally or not up to a point. Um, so our project, um, I'm uh, working with um, Fraser Sturt and Stephanie Blankshine at the University of Southampton and Angela Gannon at Historic Environment Scotland. So they're the main characters involved in the project. Uh, and uh, we'll all be up there doing different things this summer. Um, and uh, we uh got interested in we'd been working in the outer hebrides a little while ago um and but this the beginnings of this project really lie with uh a local diver who is known called chris not known as called chris murray um and um mark elliott who sadly no longer with us uh and they uh chris was uh it was a Royal Navy diver, um, so he had a lot of diving experience and he lives in um, just on the edge of Stornoway, um, the main um, town city of, of, of the Outer Hebrides. And Chris is a curious kind of person uh, and he was walking his dog one day and uh, saw a Cranog um, and thought, I wonder uh, if there might be any archaeological material around that. 
uh, and being Chris, he actually put on his um, his um, gear and actually had a look uh, and came up with um, some fantastic um, early Neolithic pots, which Mark, who I mentioned before, was able to, who was working at the museum, was able to identify. Chris wasn't, wouldn't claim to be an archaeologist, although he's very interested in archaeology. Uh, so they did that and then they got really interested in this really significant discovery and they dived a few more sites that they found literally by looking on, on Google Earth um, and spotting um, little crenogs of, with potential, which as it turned out, they really did have. So they found, Chris and Mark dived a lot more, but found about um, three or four more sites with fantastic assemblages of Neolithic pottery. Uh, which is how this came to our attention. Um, so the pottery was shown to Alison Sheridan at the National Museum. Um, and Alison knew that we were dating some pot early Neolithic pottery in the Western Seaways of Britain. So it really came together nicely for us. So we dated the pottery that Chris and Mark had found. Uh, and that's where we first got involved. Um, but um, the project proper started because Fraser and I kept saying, oh, that sounds really interesting. We should do something about that. Uh, and we kept saying that particularly because um, Fraser, um, who I've worked with for many years, um, is also a very proficient underwater archaeologist. Um, I am an unproficient underwater archaeologist now. Uh, so we finally got a grant together and went to meet Chris properly, and Chris showed us the sites. Um, and then we did a bit of preliminary work in 2016, 2017. And the Islands of Stone project has been running for about three years now, um, where which is funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. And that's a more substantial grant, enabling us to do a lot more detailed and um, in-depth research, really, than we'd been able to do previously. So that's been fantastic. That's a long answer, sorry, Tom. <laughs> well, that no, that that that's perfect, and I think it, you know it's a really good starting off point for really what you're doing this year. We can sort of leap straight into yeah. that. So that that's the question: What site are you going to be digging this summer? I believe you're going off in the next few days for that. Tomorrow so, so morning. Keep, tomorrow morning. <laughs> yeah. Oh gosh, right. Well, we won't we won't keep you. <laughs> we have right, we're packed mostly. Steph's busy doing okay, the okay, light, finishing that. touches of the packing. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. Well, um, I, I know from preparing for digs myself that there's there's uh, there's a checklist. So we'll yeah, we'll yeah. let you go and check check that um, immediately afterwards. Yeah. But yeah. Where, where then are you are you heading off to tomorrow, and what sort of techniques will you be bringing to it th this year? Yeah. So um, we're heading to the Isle of Lewis. Um, so where Chris lives and where um, he's found several sites. We we found some more last summer. Um, down in Newest, but that's um, for another time. Uh, so we're heading to a site um, called Loch Borgersdale um, that's in Carlaway in, in the Isle of Lewis. Uh, and it's a site that we have looked at um, in some for a month, two years ago, and then for uh, and a little bit of trial work before that. Um, and it's one of the ones that Chris and Mark originally found. Um, but we've ended up focusing on it for a variety of reasons, um, not least because it's got some really promising archaeology. Um, so really, we've we've done a decent bit of work on it in 2021. Um, and we're going to do some more work to solve all the questions that we have, of course, without raising any further questions at all, <laughs> as I'm sure will happen. <laughs> And what questions do 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 you do you have then? Yeah. For this year? What, what's your sort of you know in terms of archaeology? We think of it as a research question, but that sounds mm -hmm. terribly dull. But it's you know, what what, what you're what kind of know. You're trying to answer. Yeah. 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 So um, originally we were really trying to understand how people have built them, and um, particularly Chris and Mark found quite a lot of pottery, as I mentioned earlier, deposited into the loch. So we were trying to think about what these sites were that they were building. They're actually quite small islands, about 12, 15 metres across. Um, so they're not, and we have not found any sign of Neolithic um, or, or houses or anything on top of them. Um, so, so far. Um, so we were originally trying to see how they built them and um, what what they might have been in terms of what, what they were used for. 
um in a way the negative evidence of not having found any houses is the best we can do so we're not sure that they've been their people are living on them in any permanent sense and maybe they're kind of temporary locations for people to go and do certain rituals that involve maybe feasting and um, throwing pots into the log um but in a more site specific way um the work we did two years ago we we dug through the stones um, and that's where we came to the timber phase of um, architecture. Um, but And we also um, found the timbers un, un, in the underwater trench, which extends way beyond the stone islet. Um, so we'll be doing simultaneous underwater and above ground excavation uh, to try and reveal a bit more about that, find out about what the timber architecture is. At the moment, it just looks like a a pile of brushwood all, all bundled into the lock but there might well be more um more formal architectural features buildings even but perhaps um you know um a ring of posts to keep it in that kind of thing so we just want to try and understand especially the timber phase um which seems to be the original neolithic phase um a bit better basically um, I, I understand from some of the articles because you you've, you had a great article in, in Antiquity which was picked up by the international press. I spent a very enjoyable afternoon reading up on that. And if anyone searches for this site, you'll find some fantastic articles, including the Antiquity yeah. article that, that, that you guys produced on this. And you were talking about the timber there. I was thinking about the kind of structure because if you're looking at it as I, I commend people recommend people certainly to do now on, on Google Earth or, or something similar um have a look because I think there's a sort of causeway it looks like it's going out to to your site and the timber is maybe um it's also sort of underpinning the site but there's maybe some sort of timber that's stabilizing it because on three sides of 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 the cranog I think it's shallower water and then it goes away quite quickly to deep water so there's there's some different structural elements going on and even in the timber isn't there that's ex exactly right um and um from our your we wrote that article from the preliminary work we did and then when we went in 2021 we didn't expect to find quite such a substantial extent of timber um extending beyond the stone island basically um so the underwater guys are gonna um, they, they're going to have to speedily dig a, a longer trench to try and find the edge of it, basically. Um, and we've been also, you asked earlier about the kind of techniques we, we use, um, but we were up a couple of months ago doing water penetrating radar, um, which is quite a new um, technique. Um, uh, 3D or WPR for those who are in the know. Um, and that is a much more Steph and Fraser's side of things than mine. Um, but um, we were doing that in able to see through the deposits on the lock bed um, and to try and establish if um, uh, we could see the whole extent of the timber using that methodology. And the, the results are still a bit tricky, but we're hoping with a bit more processing, we'll be able to work it out. And the good thing is that we can ground truth it through the trenches as well. So we'll actually know what we're, we're looking at in the WPR, if you see what I mean. And so beyond the, I mean, I think the timber work sounds absolutely fascinating and in, in, in what you're doing just in general this year, but I think going going back, I think what people visually and hopefully we'll, on the video will maybe put up some images of this because there's there's great photos again going around the internet of of, of Chris holding Neolithic uh, pots out of, out of the water of a beautiful Scottish uh, loch. Could you tell us a little bit more about maybe just a little bit more about these pots, what, what they are when you describe them. And I think you've even sort of looked into doing some lipid analysis. So essentially looking at the sort of fats, maybe animal fats that are still preserved on the inside of some of these pots. That That's right. So, um, uh, Another of the many good things about Chris is that he's a great photographer and he's captured some brilliant, he's a great, he actually he is a really great photographer, but in even in, not just in archaeology, but for our purposes, the archaeology gets these brilliant Exc Excalibur-like sh shots <laughs> of pots coming out of the lock, which is amazing. 
Um, and we're very lucky to be um, working with um, someone called Mike Copper, um, who is the world's leading expert, I would say, in Outer Hebridean Neolithic pottery. Um, Mike did his PhD um, with Ian Armit in Bradford on um, uh, the first um, artificial island dating to the Neolithic that was found in the 80s called Island Dom. Um, so Mike's always really excellent at characterising the pottery, knowing what he's looking at and, and also comes out and digs with us, which is good. Um, so Mike's written lots of um, reports on that material and it's mainly called Hebridean ware, excitingly, um, and also Unston um, pottery, which you also get in, in Orkney and parts of northwest Scotland. Um, so there's and there's lots of really very quite complete pots. So it's it's a really fantastic set of assemblages to work on. Um, and uh, you mentioned lipids. So um, indeed, we've done some work on the lipids in these pots. Um, so um, initially, this was um, with Lucy Cramp and Simon Hamam, who were at Bristol. Uh, and uh, now uh, Lucy and I uh, are co-supervising a PhD student called Dan Brown, uh, who is just doing a lot of lipid work for his whole PhD. Um, so, and Dan's about a year and a half into his PhD, so he's already got some very promising results, uh, which is really cool. And so he's able to do a more in-depth analysis because of the preservation. It Basically, the lipids preserve really well they think because it's underwater um so the lipids for people that may not know are, are like the kind of residues of food that gets absorbed into the ceramic so we can kind of know um what um people are eating and a good thing that happened with out of lucy and simon's work was that they were able they were they're bit, they've been pioneering a new technique that looks for cereals um in the biomarkers which is as I said, new uh, and very exciting. And um, they were got some brilliant results, um, which led to, as you may have already seen in the press as well, so lots of very good press coverage about the world's uh, oldest porridge, um, yeah. which was appropriately found in Scotland, obviously. Uh, so that was also a good bit of coverage. But they did get, the reason they were able to say that was because they could tell that they had cereals and they could tell that they'd also had milk in the same pots. So you could imagine, you can begin to imagine recipes, including obviously mixed up oats and milk to make porridge. Um, so that was a good story, but it's also really cool because you can actually begin to look at, you know, the recipes of food that people were eating. And that's really exciting. So that's that's another ongoing piece of work that that Dan's working on probably right now as we speak. Well, that's, I mean, yeah, it's fast. I mean, you're making this even easier to sell as a, as a, as a podcast. We've got all the, 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 you know, the amazing stories that, and again, your, your, your outreach work is, is, I think is, is, is something we can all learn from. And you've got the social media, you've got various sites and you, you obviously um, have good relations with the press, but there's something new and very uh, exciting that you're working with, with the ordnance survey and you, you've got there's um, on, on one of their apps if you just tell people about that maybe how they can how they can get that and, and do some uh, some experience of, of your sites that's right tom so um as part of the project as you say we've been working and um, collaborating with the ordnance survey on their secret stories app uh and uh um, the secret stories that we've been working on are, are, are two, uh, and one is, and we, the 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 point of doing this is really to let, um, especially visitors to the islands, tourists, um, have easy access to some great prehistoric archaeological sites to visit while they're there, because there are some fantastic ones, and lots of people that work in the Outer Hebrides feel that Orkney unfairly overshadows the great archaeology that we all know is there. Um, so we're doing our bit to to right that balance. Um, and so we've created um, two stories within the, the, the Secret Stories app, um, one of which is a series of fantastic sites along the Hebridean Way, which lots of people cycle along or walk. Um, and really excitingly, last week, we just um, launched one that focuses on the Kalanish landscape, the most famous, um, amazing stone circle and more um the most one of the most famous 
um, stone circles in Britain, I'd say. Um, and uh, what we've been trying to do, we know lots of people come to Callanish, um, but there's a series of stone circles all around that local landscape that were part of this um, big complex of ritual monuments. And so we've, um, the app shows you where all of those are located in space and also gives you some information about them if you'd like to visit one or even all 10 i think it's 10 that we've got um on the app so um that's that's really exciting and, and we've worked with the calendar visitor center on that and hopefully um that will um really um kind of enhance people's the, the dedicated um, archaeological tourists um, visits to, to Kalanish because they can get to see a load more of the sites around there quite easily and find out about them, which is exciting. Yeah. Yeah, I downloaded that just this morning and it, it does look fantastic. And we'll, we'll give everybody the, the links to, to, to these stories Thanks, and, to, and, and to, to this app as well. So just to sort of to, to round up then, um, about I think we just go to the islands of stone as as, as a whole and and what it's saying about the the Neolithic and and what we're learning about Cranogs and sort of dating them in in the West Isles of the Outer Hebrides. What what is the sort of takeaway you'd like people to to take away from from this segment of 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 the Dig It Scotland podcast about what we've learned and what are learning and what we hope to learn about Cranogs and Cranogs specifically in 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 the Western Isles. Yeah, good, good question. Um, so, um, in terms of Cranogs, it's it's. I mentioned the one that Ian Armit and his team excavated in the 1980s, and that was a unique site. And when you've only got one, it's very difficult to say it's a new kind of site. Um, so, what what Chris and Mark and subsequently our project has done is demonstrate that there's there's way more than just that one, um, and that's really good because now you can say. In the Outer Hebrides, there are Neolithic Cranogs, um, and uh, they seem to be quite a kind of varied set of sites for, from what we can tell, which is interesting. Um, and that is exciting because it extends the date of Cranogs as a, as a category back, you know, two and a half, three thousand years further than we, we thought they were, um, which is a long time, as you know. Um, and that's exciting in itself. Uh, it's a new kind of site for the for the Neolithic of Britain, which is also really fantastic. Um, a question that is 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 bugging us, and we're we're vaguely trying to solve, is whether Neolithic Cranogs might exist not just in the Outer Hebrides, but more widely across, especially Scotland, maybe Ireland as well. Um, and that's something that we've been working on and have recently recently submitted a paper about. Uh, so that's ongoing research because that would be really, you know, once you've got them across this island group, you wonder, was it unique to that particular region, which is possible, um, but maybe um, it's possible also that they extend beyond that. So we'd like to try and resolve that, but that's all, all for the future. Um, so that's another kind of exciting open-ended question that remains for us to resolve. Well, I mean, I think it's all that's left for me to say is say thank you so much, Professor. You've you whetted my appetite literally in terms of talking about porridge, <laughs> um, but also in terms of this uh, amazing archaeology and the fact that we've got you know a new area of archaeology to to look at is something that you know doesn't doesn't happen every year or every decade or necessarily every century. So. Um, yeah, we're very excited. Um, we wish you the best of luck uh, going away tomorrow. And uh, yeah, uh, hopefully you'll come back at some point in the future and be able to tell us and tell the world about all the, the amazing finds that you're going to get. Yeah, that sounds good. Cool. Thanks so much. All right. Bye. Well, you know, I hope the listeners and viewers are not getting sick of me saying this, but spectacular. <laughs> what 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 discoveries and the beautiful visuals as well for for people that have seen me the social media posts about this or go to the islands of stone website just to get amazing drone shots amazing neolithic uh ceramics and just the potential for it really changing the way that we look across europe at at um sort of waterside and 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 uh sort of Loch Lake living and and ritual and depositions of of these these incredible pots. It's just I I mean I was blown away. I don't I don't know about you. What what did you think, Luke? 
It was amazing. Uh, and to have it coupled with the images that we were luckily sent over is, is something very special. I think if you are listening to this on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts right now, do, I'd say, check out the YouTube version as well, even if you have a quick flick through it, because the, the visuals that were provided for us for this are, are really amazing and really drives home, I suppose, the, how cool this is, really. And it's it's it, it's cool that we'll be working with Diggett and working with Professor Garrow and, and the research team. The research teams, there's, there's been a long history of of, of research and, and people finding out the, the Neolithic or, origins of the these Cranogs and they're they're great on social media. They've got a beautiful website. So go to that Islands of Stone, watch it on our YouTube. Um because yeah, it's it's it, it just takes you back to that elemental, that sort of youthful sort of love of archaeology when you see that artifact or you think about something in a completely new way and it's just this huge revelation. And I think this podcast has done a fantastic job of of sailing archaeology in Scotland, sailing this the study of these underwater um, aspects of these cranogs. Um, yeah, I'm just yeah. As I say, um, I would hopefully I would just you know, listen to this if I were just a listener, never mind a presenter. But it was it was yeah, it was a privilege to listen to that. Absolutely, and if you enjoyed it, and if you enjoy podcasts like this, make sure to give us a subscribe, give us a follow if you haven't already, leave us a rating and a review wherever you listen to your podcast because that's how uh, this can grow. That's how people can learn about this podcast and. Um, if you want to, maybe share it with somebody who you think might be interested. Stick it up on your Twitter. Stick it up on your or X. It's called X now. Stick it up on your X. Stick it up on your Instagram. Stick it up on your Facebook, your LinkedIn, anything at all. Tag us. Let us know what you thought of it. And hopefully you'll tune in to our next one coming in two weeks. Yes. Enjoy. And we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.